Because that's our society. What I'm trying to tell you is we're so, the society we're living in is a feel-good society. And even the church likes to make people feel good. Let me tell y'all a little secret. I would rather just make you feel good. I would. Because you know what? I like you. Now, I won't tell you that I did. I always liked you, but I like you. <laughs> and, I, and, and I like for you to like me. Come on. I appreciate your kind thoughts toward me. I do. So therefore, I don't want to spank you. It's like grandmas. You know, when you're the grandma, you don't have to spank. I mean the great-grandma. When you're great-grandma, you don't have to spank. I'm twice removed from discipline. <laughs> so I don't have to discipline my little JC. She got two between me and her. They'll take care of her discipline. I just get to enjoy. Amen. Smooch on her, you know. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it's just fun to be the great-grandmother, but I'm not y'all's great-grandmother. And you know what? I have one I'm going to answer to. And one of these days, I'm going to heaven. I don't want a single person to say to me, if you'd have told me, I'd be going to heaven with you. But you didn't tell me. So I'd rather you not like what I say, even if it means you choose to not like me. I'm not setting you up. I'm just going to preach what God laid on my heart, because it's been on my heart all week. You know, sometimes God waits till Sunday morning before he really gives me a solid, and that's it. But man, all week, all week long, this message has been on my heart. And I'm just praying about it, saying, Lord, first of all, do you want me to preach? You want somebody else to preach? I don't care. But then I just kept feeling so deeply this message this morning, knowing and after a while, you just got to say, Lord, I'm hearing I'm hearing. So I just want to talk to you this morning about the altar. A-L-T-A-R. Altar. From Genesis all the way through to Revelation and in Revelation, there's an altar all the way through the Word of God. From Genesis, the first altar was built by God's people under the direction of God to build him an altar. Remember? And all down through every single book of the Bible, God still is dealing with the altar. Even in the Gospels, Jesus dealt with the altar. And through Paul's writings and then fully in the Revelation, we see that altar in heaven. So throughout eternity, there will be an altar. Did you know that? Everything's not forever, but an altar is forever. The value of an altar is beyond what we think it is. And it's not just the object, and we're going to get into that this morning. It's not just the object. It's what God intends there the work that he wants to do there. Now, we're going to be looking at the, at the book of Hosea this morning, but before we go there, I want to give you a little background on Hosea that most of you may know. But Hosea was a prophet of God, and God told him to marry a prostitute. You, I don't know about you, but God would have to speak out loud. <laughs> but, you know, he may have spoken out loud to Hosea, and he told him to go and marry a prostitute. And he had children with her. But so often, once a person, especially in the Old Testament, walked in something like this, they managed to go back to it. And in the Old Testament, we see Israel going back to prostitution. Because we're going to see Israel as the type. Gomer, the prostitute, is a type of Israel. And God is using the story of Hosea and Gomer 
to give a message to Israel and of course that message will also be to us so after having some children Gomer runs away leaves him and goes back into prostitution and is finally placed on a slave auction block where we all were at one time in our life maybe there's someone here today you're on that auction block you have sold out to sin you don't think there's any hope and you're living a life of sin and you're allowing things to happen in your life and sins to come into your life and you're on the auction block and you're waiting for the highest bidder and the devil is bidding and Jesus is bidding and you are the one who will decide who will win the auction and so Hosea goes to the auction block and he finds Gomer there in her state of prostitution and God says bid the price for her and he bids the highest bid that anybody would make for Gomer and he receives Gomer back to himself and takes her home to her children and God is saying to Israel I have bid for you and I am coming to you to draw you back to myself to bring you back to myself even though you have forsaken me and you have served other I you've served idols and you've walked in debauchery and you you know Israel even burned their children to false gods just like America's doing today burning our babies to the God of self and pride and deception as going on in America today and so I'm not talking about burning them with fire I'm talking about destroying babies for our own pride come on and these things are happening Israel went away from God chose not to serve God but God wanted to show them I don't care how far you've gone I don't care how bad you become I am still bidding for you on that auction block today and I want you to know that no matter where you've been or what you've done I, this is one message I want to get through to you today I don't care what the devil tries to lie to you about some of you are believing the lies of the devil that's why you won't go to the altar you think you have failed too much you think you have maybe you've overgone to the altar you think I've been to the altar so many times I'm not going back again all these excuses that we put up in our mind to keep us from where we need to be you know it's like the old man that rode the horse down the path through the pasture and there was a rack of hay sticking up there and the horse got shied away from it and he started carrying on and man said you stupid horse you're scared of what you ought to be full of and we're scared of what we ought to be full of sometimes and the enemy comes in to destroy us to make us think there is no hope that's his job and he does a good job he wants you to think that there's no way that God's going to take you that God's going to change you that God's going to use you you're too big a mess some of you are in here this morning you think you're too big a mess I want you to know that God is in the business of taking messes and turning them into what he wants them to be and what he wants them to be is the best you will ever be there's no exceptions to the rule I'm going to scan the audience this morning and I want you to know there's not one exception in this place to the rule that God has a place for you a plan for you he loves you he's calling to you he's telling you to lay down your past forget about your junk quit letting the devil make excuses to you and get out of the rut and start doing something about where you are reach forward into that blessing that God has for you quit being that gomer that thinks there is no hope quit being that person that everybody's looking down on because it doesn't matter what other people think it doesn't matter that other people know you're mess up come on i'm preaching right now hadn't even got to my sermon but i'm preaching right it doesn't matter you sit around and say well everybody knows i blah 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 that's a devil's voice that's the devil's God's voice is never gonna say that kind of garbage to you he's never gonna say you've just messed up too many times you've the whole you know everybody in the devil is so funny everybody in Natchitoches knows blah 
That is a lie. Everybody in Natchitoches don't know, and most people in Natchitoches don't care. Just to let you know. And then the biggest lie of all is the devil says, everybody in the church knows what you did. Uh, no, that is not true either. Just to, just to set your mind at ease. First of all, what these pastors know about you, we don't tell anybody. So if you think we'd go out and tell somebody some failure of yours, then you just don't know us. Because we want the best for you. We're like, you're like our kids. I'm not going to tell you ever, I, I mean, I apologize for telling y'all that Jerry, I had to slap Jerry one time. But <laughs> I'm not going to tell you all about my kids and, 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 and even about my son-in-laws. I'm not going to say, oh, let me tell you about Young. You know, people come up all the time saying, man, Young is so kind. I'm not going to say, well, you just don't know him. <laughs> even if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. But even, you know, I'm not going to reveal anything bad about somebody in here because I love you and I want everybody in here to grow in the image of Christ. And I want to give you a second chance and a third chance and a 15th chance and a 100th chance to grow into what God wants you to be. I'm on your side. I'm, I'm the cheerleader in your section. So people don't know what's going on in your life. Almost nobody, just a handful of people may know something. And if they don't love you through it, then they are wrong. So I want you to know that God's in the buying back business. The buying back business. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. God bought me back. Has God bought you back? He's brought us back. I'm so glad to tell you that he never thinks you're worthless. God never thinks you're a hopeless case. God never thinks you're not worth anything. God didn't think that way. It's impossible for him to think that way because he loves you greater than anybody else could possibly ever love you. So we see this scripture in Hosea where God is giving Hosea directions in dealing with the nation of Israel in the comparison of the situation with his home and his marriage. So we're going to look in Hosea chapter 14, and I'm going to read for you verse number 1 and 2. This is what God says to Israel through Hosea the prophet. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Let me say that again. Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. When you go into sin and don't repent of it, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. You've got to bring it to the altar. What did I say? The altar. When you sin, you bring it to the altar. You don't run from the altar. When you sin, you bring it to the altar. You don't run from the altar. Come on. Be honest. Don't worry about if somebody thinks you're coming to the altar because you've sinned. Maybe you have. So what? We all have. Lies of the enemy. Then it says, he's telling Israel what to say. Take with you words. I preached this, a sermon this, using this a long time ago. Maybe none of you remember it. Probably not. Jada told me she forgot what Courtney said. Made me feel better because she forgot what I said too. <laughs> so I know you might not remember this message. I remember preaching this sermon though. <laughs> Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say, everybody say, say. say. Unto him. Say unto him. Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously so we will render the calves of our lips. Now I am fortunate enough to have access to the Jewish Bible and I read this in the Jewish Bible, and I thought, how wonderful it was. Now, Autumn cannot put the Jewish Bible up there, I don't think, but I'm going to read it for you. It says, this is Hosea 14, 2 and 3 in the Jewish Bible. Isn't that interesting? 
return Israel to Adonai, your God. For your guilt has made you stumble. When you feel guilty, you start stumbling if you don't run to the altar. First thing to do when you're guilty, run to the altar. Run, run, run. Come on. Run to the altar. Take words with you and return to Adonai. Say to him, this is what I'm going to say to Adonai, the Lord. Forgive all guilt and accept what is good. We will pay instead of bulls. This is the part I like. We will pay instead of bulls the offerings of our lips. I love that. You know, God didn't say to Israel, take thoughts with you. Sink in. <laughs> he did not say, take thoughts with you. Return to the Lord, he said. He did not say, return to the Lord and take thoughts with you. I'm making a point. I hope you listen. I'm trying to get your attention. He did not say that. He said, return to the Lord. Take words with you. A sacrifice of your lips not your brain. So often, when we come to the Lord, to the altar, I pray that you have no inhibitions to coming to the altar. Whatever there is about coming to the altar in your brain, you need to defy that by coming. If you've got an attitude that says, I don't need to come to the altar, then defy that and come, because we all need to come. When you say, uh, whatever the excuse is, you know, some of you can't kneel, but you can come to the altar. Right now I'm talking about this place prepared for prayer. This is, this is our altar at Oasis of Love. You can have an altar at home, certainly. You should have an altar at home. But there's, an, there's something else about coming in the presence of the Lord to the altar where the Holy Spirit is moving in a corporate anointing and there is freedom and the word has been preached that has given you the oil that has, that has uh, moving those things in you that need to move and you come right then at the moment where the Holy Spirit is speaking and you can deal with the situation whereas if you go home, you'll, you'll forget about it all day and maybe later on in the week you'll think about it. But right now you gotta deal with those circumstances. That's why it's so important to make those moves regardless of your preconceived notions about, well, I'm just not a person who kneels at the altar. I'm just not a person who goes to the altar. Well, you know, just because you're a person doesn't mean that, that you're the right person doing the right thing. And it's just time to get rid of all that junk and say, I don't care about my preconceived notions about who I am. I don't care about what anybody else thinks about me. It's time to get ready to say, I don't care anymore because I'm going to get hungrier for the things of God. I want to be fuller of the things of God than to let anything, anybody, or even my own notions stop me from moving into the things where God wants to move in me because God is getting ready to do some great things before he comes. And I'm telling you, church, it's time to... Put everything down. Just get rid of all that junk. Throw all that junk away. It's not worth wasting your days on. Bring yourself to the altar. It's a place of return. The altar is a place of return to God. You know, maybe that doesn't mean you're returning to God because you've backslidden technically, but because you've just uh, forgotten that God has to be that primary source, the one that you care for, the one who is more important in your life. Just like I told like Wednesday night, I talked to the class this morning about the five foolish versions and the five wise versions. Those wise virgins were ones who said, I gotta stay full of the oil. Whatever it takes, other people may be out there wasting their oil, going here and doing that and getting their mind off the bridegroom. But I gotta be one of those who stays full of the oil. I gotta go back to that place all the time. I gotta keep going back to that place to draw that oil because I wanna be ready for the bridegroom. I wanna be looking for the bridegroom. I don't want to see the 
the door shut and me left outside. I want to be one that's full of oil, that's full of passion for Jesus, moving into the realm where he wants me to go. So therefore, if you think I'm stupid for falling over the altar all the time, I don't give a hoot because I'm getting through the door, folks. I'm going through the door. I don't want the door shut in front of me. I want it to be shut behind me because I have entered into the joy of the Lord and into the marriage of the Lamb. I'm going there, and I want you to go there too by the grace of God. So, the altar is that place of return. And then it says to take words with me. If you have not been praying out loud, and you're not seeing a change in your life, maybe it's time to make a change. You know, uh, Michelle, you'll come up here. You can leave him sitting there. Jerry, I'll hold him down. You know, if I walk up to Michelle and I go, does that say anything to you? No, oh, ma'am. <laughs> but if I say, Michelle, I really love you. And I'll tell you I love you back. And it would mean See so the much. response? See the response? I didn't ask her for that response. She gave me that response because why? Because I said, Michelle, I love you. And then I got a response. Not until I said it, though. He said, but God can read my mind. Yes, he can, but he doesn't want to. He wants to read you by lips. You may be seated. He wants to read your lips. This word says, I want to bring a sacrifice to my lips, not my mind, my lips. So when I come to the altar, I got to talk to him. He's a person. He's not a thing. He's not a cloud. He's a person. Jesus is still a man. Glorified man, but he's a man in heaven. Did you know that? Did you know Jesus is a man? Yes. When you see him, you're going to see his body. You're going to see him. You're going to see his hands, his feet. You're going to see him. When you see him, you're going to see him. He's not a vapor in the wind. And so when I walk up to him at the altar, I need to do the same thing I did to Michelle. I love you, Jesus. Maybe I need to say, God, I'm a mess. I am a mess. I am a failure. Maybe you have to say that. But it needs to be said. You say, somebody might hear me. Well, so what? You got to get over that mess. You got to get over that junk. You know what? Every single person in here is a mess sometime. There's not a one of us that's so perfect that we can come down and say, God, I know you're just so blessed to have me. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> it don't work that way. We're so blessed to have him. And there's none of us that's worthy. It's all by his grace he makes us worthy, but we're not worthy. But we come on credit. We come because he gives us credit. He gives us freedom to come. Return to the Lord and bring words with you. Be honest before the Lord. You know, tell him what is going on in your life. Tell him. Don't tell everybody. You know, he'll never tell people. You, you don't want anybody to know your junk? Just tell him because he won't tell people. Somebody else you trust might go out and tell somebody something. But you know what? He will never. He will listen to you. He won't condemn you. He will draw you. You can tell him, Lord, I messed up this week. And, I, you know, don't, don't say, Lord, forgive me for my many sins. Be honest with, before God. Say, God, I, I told lies this week. I, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Change my heart so I don't want to lie anymore. Lord, I, 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 whatever. I committed adultery, Lord. I'm wrong. I have sinned. Be honest. Don't, don't come with that pristine idea that you're so holy. We're none of us. We all need changes in our lives. 
We all need something. We need God to work something in us that needs to be done. And I'm telling you, church, it's time to talk to the Lord like he's a person because he is. I have found out that when I start talking to him out loud, even in my living room, he shows up. How do I know he shows up? All of a sudden, I just feel his presence come in the room. You just feel his presence come in the room. And I'm just, you know, I got a chair I pray, and I, I recommend you find a prayer spot in your room, in your house. Find a place that you call your prayer spot. We, we called it the secret place years ago. A, sp a special chair you kneel to in front of, a special chair you sit in. I've got a, I've got a chair in my house that takes away, you know, it puts your head way lower than your feet. That's my prayer chair. I go sit in that chair, put my feet all the way up in the air, turn on some godly music, some praise and worship songs, and I just start out every morning saying, I love you, Jesus. Thank you for this day and your blessings upon my life. Thank you for health this morning. Thank you that my husband's in there asleep and he's, he's still well this morning. He's going to get up in a few minutes if he had not already gotten up. Lord, I thank you for my children, and I thank you for our church. I thank you for every blessing in my life. Lord, I thank you for your great goodness to me. I start out every prayer time just thanking Jesus and worshiping him and thanking for already what he's done in my life. And sometimes I never get around to asking him anything. Just, well, just in his presence, just soaking in his presence. And then it's time for me to get up and go. And other times he puts things on my heart to pray for but I'll let him determine that because I'm not my own. I don't belong to me. I belong to him. So whatever he wants is what I want to give. The next thing the altar is is a place of humility. He said, your guilt has made you stumble. If you don't deal with guilt, you're in a bad place. And the only place to deal with guilt is not publicly, you don't have to go confess your sins to people. There's not a human being on this planet who can help you when you confess your sins to them. Not a one. Did you know that? There's not a single person. You confess all your sins to me, it will not do anything for you. You can confess all your sins to anybody you want to, it will not do anything for you. Because there's only one who bled for you. And his name is Jesus. And you go strictly to the throne room of Almighty God. You have access. The Bible says, when Jesus said, it is finished, the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, which means that we now all, all of us, have access to the throne of God. We don't have to go through anybody. And from that point on, the priesthood was done away with, and all believers are priests. We're all priests unto God. And so now I can go in as one of the priesthood of God, into the Holy of Holies to talk to God for myself. And I can do that at the altar. I can do that at the place of prayer. It's a place of humility, by the way. No pride can ever get there. So he says, you, he says, forgive all our guilt. I'm humble enough to believe and understand that I need help with guilt. And so forgive all guilt. The altar is a place where we give gifts to God. He says, instead of bulls, I'm bringing you the offering of my lips. So the altar is a place where I bring a gift to God. Isn't it amazing that I can give the universe, the king of the universe, a gift? The only, I'm the only one who can give it. You can't give the words of my lips. Your mom and your daddy or anybody else can give the words of your lips to God. Only you. No matter what your age, no matter what your circumstances are, I don't care, those little bitty kids, they need to be trained to, to talk to God out loud. Start when they're little, because when they get to be about 10, they get too smart to pray. They're real stubborn. If somebody doesn't keep encouraging them to bring those lips to God, get them while they're young. You don't want them to have to go through what you're going through, not being able to talk out loud and praise God like you want to. So don't let your kids get there. Start them out young, t encouraging them to pray out. Talk. Use words to the Lord. Use it while they're young. Come on. And so you can come and bring gifts to the Lord. 
I like to think of that. You know, how many of you like to give gifts? We're going into the season. Do you like to give gifts to your friends or to your family? Doesn't it make you feel good? How many of you would rather give a gift than to receive one? Don't lie now, don't lie. <laughs> I'd rather give a gift than receive one. <laughs> but you know what? To imagine that I can give God a gift that you can't give him. No matter how much you love Jesus and you love me, you can't give my gift to Jesus. I'm the only one who can bring my gift to the altar and give it to the Lord. Now the Bible talks about if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember you have somebody who's got an ought against you, go be reconciled to that person and come back to the altar. So sometimes we have to be reconciled. Sometimes we have to go and we have to make that thing right. Then we come back and bring that gift and then God will receive it. Amen? The altar is a place of waiting. The scripture says in Lamentations, beginning at chapter 3, verse 25, the Bible says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. Oh, I like that, don't you? Let's all say that together. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. <laughs> to the soul that seeketh him. Next. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord, that means staying in the altar, shall renew their strength. This is the Bible. They shall mount up with wings. Why do we not have the strength and the, and the wings? Because we don't wait. As eagles. We shall run and not be weary. Are you having, are you weary? We can walk and not faint. Are you fainting? Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. You see, the reason many Christians are weak and fainting, weary, and have no fire in their bones is because they never wait in the altars. Too busy. Some of you, like, it's almost time for lunch. There'll be some of you right now that say, man, I got to get to that restaurant. I'm hungry. God help us to be hungry for the food of the manna from heaven than from the natural food that we might be planning to eat today. You know, I found out in his presence I'm not hungry. Now, after I get through here and I'm out of this anointing and out of this realm of worship, boy, all of a sudden I'm starving to death. But while I'm here, I'm fine because he fills everything. So the altar is the place where you wait. You know, church, when you come, don't worry about who's getting up. People will stay here with you and lock up these doors. Perry's locking up the doors today, and I guarantee you, I know Perry Mobley, and if you want to be in the altar, he'll stay here all afternoon. And he'll pray with you. He'll be here. Because nobody's in a hurry. This is not, this is important. This is, a, this is the Lord's day. This is the Lord's day. More important than family reunions, family gatherings, family this or family that, or food or meals, this is the important time to say, Lord, put salt in my water so I'll be thirsty again. Whatever it takes, Lord, for me to be thirsty, help me, Lord, to wait. And also the altar is a place of refreshing. The scripture says in Acts 3 and 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You know, sometimes the reason the Lord can't refresh us is because we have springs in our knees or our rear end, whichever one. <laughs> Some of us can't kneel, but we sit down. But about the time we get seated, we're up again and gone. You know, any time I start praying, I always want to hurry up and get through. Did y'all hear what I just said? Every time I start praying, I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, I got something to do. I hope I can get through in a hurry. Come on. But if I'll just shut up, and I, sometimes I say, Lord, forgive me for letting my mind wander. 
Because my mind goes to things I'm supposed to be doing today too. And I just say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Help me to capture every thought and bring in the obedience of Christ and just sit here. If the whole world falls apart because I'm not out there doing something, then help me to lay it all down and just sit here until you're ready for me to go. Because that's what this altar is for. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry your burdens anymore. That's what the altars are for. Y'all can come forward. And let me just say this. The pastor built these altars. He put together these frames, put the top on it. He also covered them with this material. He, he built these altars with his hands. He built these altars so you'd have one. That's why. He didn't build it for himself, although he uses them. He usually uses the chair, but he uses the altars. But he built these altars so you'd have an altar in this church. And so I'm telling you this morning, you have enough time. You have enough time. Because the time we spend with Jesus is the only important time. And if you're here this morning, never would force anyone to come. If you're here this morning and you're not sure you're ready to meet Jesus, now's the time to come sit here at this altar and talk to the one who can give you the confidence and the assurance that you're ready. If you're here this morning and you just feel far away from him, just feel cold, there's warmth at his altar. If you can't kneel, these front chairs down here are available to you. I started to clear off these over here but I believe we can make it. If we had, if, if you, there's no place for you to sit, you clear a spot on these front things up here where Paul, the pastor also made for you to pray. And you come and be seated there. Because this is a time. Friday night, we're gonna do this again. We're coming together, the young people are gonna be, pray, gonna be playing music at the beginning of the service. And we're just gonna come in and soak in his presence around the altars. And then the last hour, they're going to be singing and we're going to be worshiping. Every single one of you is invited, from the youngest to the oldest, to come take advantage of soaking in the presence of the Lord. Because I want to tell you, you never lose time. You're never wasting time. You're never wasting time when you spend time with Jesus. So if you possibly will this morning, we're going to sing this song. This song is an old, old song. It got into my spirit at the first of the week, and I could not let it go. It says, that's what this altar's for. Jerry's going to sing it. I want you to come forward at your own will to say, Lord, I'm coming. I'm putting aside myself, putting aside my opinions. I'm going to use this altar for what it's meant to just come and wait on you.
Set us a fire. 